fire. A fire that will make you to burn for the Lord. fire that will cause you to be fruitful in the Lord. A fire that will kindle your soul and cause your passion to burn with glowing adoration. That the Lord will so impart that fire upon you that you will run and you will not be weary. You will pray and you will not cease to pray. And all that the Lord has committed into our hands, that by his grace we will be able to do them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Lord and our God, we bless your name. We thank you for bringing us to your presence. We are grateful that you are a God of power. A God that can do all things. Your word says, with you, nothing shall be impossible. So, Lord, as we partner with you, as we progress with you, as we persevere in our inheritance, we believe that, Lord, you will move us forward in Jesus' name. Lord of glory, we are trusting that all that you have done already in our lives, the seeds that you have sown, Lord, we pray they will begin to bear fruit in Jesus' name. We're asking that, Lord, this will not be fruit that only we ourselves will see, but others will see, and they will enjoy it, and they will glorify our Father that is in heaven. We thank you for the answer. Lord, we pray for the few minutes that we have. We will speak to our heart again in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm hoping that you can hear me very clearly because I really can't hear myself very well. You'll be wondering why. I just came out of a plane and I can barely hear myself. So I'm not sure if you are hearing me. So if I shout, know that I'm trying to reach you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I've just, uh, I came back from Tulsa, Oklahoma this morning. Uh, actually, I arrived at 10.30. So many of you didn't see me early uh, in the service. That's because uh, my plane came a little late. Uh, but here we are, amen? I said here we are. And uh, I just want to encourage you uh, that you want to get yourself stronger in the Lord, amen? You want to make yourself stronger in the Lord. Uh, because there are many that started the race, and it's like when the race started, it was like a smoke. And then it became a fire, right? And if care is not taken, the fire becomes what? A smoke and ashes. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. I said that will not be your portion in Jesus' name. And so we as believers, as children of God, the Lord has uh, put a lot in our life. And uh, we need to show what the Lord has given us. And as we show it, it will bring glory to his name in Jesus' name. I'd like to talk to us this morning on the foundation for gracious fruitfulness. Foundation for gracious fruitfulness. As you and I know, we just finished our retreat, and I believe the Lord visited you wonderfully, and the Lord ministered to you in a wonderful way. But the question I think we should ask ourselves is, what next? You receive the Lord from the retreat. What next? The Lord spoke to you and did great things in your life. What next? Great miracles were done in your life. What next? 
What is the next thing? What's the next step for you as a person, for you as a believer? And I think God has great, great plan for you. The only thing he's asking is that you partner with him. Amen? God wants you to be his partner in enriching you, in blessing you, in doing great things in your life. And my prayer is that what God planned for you, by the grace of God, it will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. In Psalm 87, Psalm 87, foundation for gracious fruitfulness. The Lord expects you and I to be fruitful based on all that he has done in our lives. And so we want to make sure that what God has given unto us, we are not just keeping it to ourselves. We are not just looking down on those things. We want to magnify those things. We want to exalt those things. We want to put them to use so that the glory of the Lord will be seen in our lives. Psalm 87, I'm reading from verse 1. His foundation is in the holy mountains. Can somebody say amen? amen? Your foundation, my foundation, our foundation together, the Bible says, is in where? In the holy mountains. In the holy mountains. That means God himself has given us an impeccable foundation. God himself has set us up on an impeccable foundation. God himself has set our feet on a very solid foundation. He says his foundation is in the holy mountains. That means if you and I are in that holy mountain, that means we are lifted high up. Amen. Amen. When you look around the city, what do you see around? It's the mountains, the heights. And the Bible is saying here that your foundation, my foundation, our foundation together is in the holy mountains. And if it is so, then people must see it. Amen? Because when you walk around the city, the, the mountains that surround the city, they are not hidden. You drive around, you see them. And so if your foundation is on the holy mountain, people must see that foundation. People must see you on that foundation, the foundation of holiness and of righteousness. And then in verse 2, he says, The Lord loveth the gate of Zion. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. That's a wonderful saying that the love of God has been shared abroad in your heart. And with that love of God in your heart, you can do great things. You can achieve the impossible. You can mount up with wings as eagles. He says, since your foundation is in the holy mountains, the Lord loves the gate of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. I said, glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. That means that the testimony that people are going to be hearing about you are going to be good testimonies, great testimonies, gracious testimonies. People will be hearing about you in Jesus' name. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Now, if you know the story of Rahab, she was not a worthy woman. But in the city of God, in the grace of God, in the mercy of God, Rahab became someone that could be reckoned with. Amen? So the Lord is saying, no matter what you may be thinking about yourself, you are reckoned with in the kingdom of God. Can somebody say amen to that? If somebody believes in that, can they say Amen. Do you believe you are reckoned with in heaven? Do you believe that? Because my Bible tells me that heaven rejoices at the salvation of one sinner. So if you already know the Lord, the heavens are rejoicing about you. There is something remarkable about you that God knows and you must know. 
and you must rejoice in that remarkable thing. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia, this man was born there. Praise the Lord. God says out of all those cities, out of those individual cities, God have his people there. God has his name there. God is bringing people out of there. This man is there. That woman is there. He talks about Rahab. talks about Babylon. That tells me that there is hope for every man and every woman. That tells me that there is hope for every city. If we can talk about Babylon, and God can save people out of the city of Babylon, then I believe there is great hope even for, that, for America. There is great hope for our city here. There is great hope for a city all over the world that you may be thinking about. It says, And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall do what? Shall do what? Shall do what? Establish her. Establishment of the Lord. So that tells me that when we find our foundation in the Lord, in the holy mountains, there are wonderful things that the Lord will do. And my prayer is that God will do wonderful things in your life. My prayer is that God will do gracious things in your life. My prayer is that God will do great things in your life in Jesus' name. He says, of Zion it shall be said, this and that man was born in her. That means there are multitudes of people that are going to come out of all the nations and the Lord is going to bring them to himself. This and that man was born in her and the highest himself. That means God himself is going to establish you. God himself is going to help you. The Lord shall count when he righted up the people and this man was born there. Your inheritance will not be taken out of, the, of, of there. I said your inheritance will not be taken out of there. Because he says, God himself, he will count his people. And when he righted up the people, that this man was born there. In the holy city. In the holy Jerusalem. That God is bringing down. The Lord will find you there in Jesus' name. As well as the singers, as the players on instrument, shall be there. All my springs are in thee. Praise the Lord. All my springs. And I think that springs you forward to do great things. God says all his springs are in you. That means all the possibilities of God are in you. I think you need to tell yourself that. All the possibilities of God are in me. All the possibilities of God are in me. All the goodness of the Lord are in me. All the graciousness of God are in me. It says, all my springs are in thee. That means all the virtue that you and I need to become who God wants us to be is in us. And God will cause those springs to spring forward in Jesus' name. So the Lord is calling us to fruitfulness. And he has laid that foundation for us. Number one, the foundation of salvation. Of belonging in the holy mountain. His foundation is in the holy mountains. If you are not come to that holy mountain, God is saying, here is another opportunity. Here is another day for you to come to his holy mountain. To become part of those who are going to be counted by the law. The question is, what of those of us who have been counted already? Whose names are written there? What does the Lord expect of us? God expects fruitfulness. All that the Lord has given unto us. God doesn't want us to just keep it to ourselves. We need to make sure that we are spreading forth the blessing of the Lord. Look at what Psalm 89 says. Now you have the foundation. Now you are counted by the Lord. Now, what should you be doing? Psalm 89, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord 
For how long? For how long? Should it only be at the time of the retreat, we sing and praise the Lord? Should it be only when we are happy, we praise the Lord? Should it only be when our needs are met, we praise the Lord? He says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. It means all the mercies that the Lord has shown to you and to me. We need to begin to sing about them. Amen? We need to begin to talk about them. He says, with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to who? All generations. You know, as I read this Psalm 89, there is something I see there that I'm going to apply to the whole message today. It is that letter, I. Go back there. It began in Psalm 89 with, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. That's a personal decision. That's not a decision somebody has to make for you. That's not a decision that somebody has to force you. It is something that you have to consciously do. The psalmist said, I will sing. That's an individual thing. I call it the I solution. A solution that it's already given to you, but you decided that you are going to apply it to yourself, to your life. The I solution. The solution that the individual applies as a result of what God has done. As a result of the holy foundation that the Lord has given him. As a result of belonging and being counted as part of the people of God. Now you make a determination. You make a decision in your heart. And you said, I will sing. And let me tell you, singing is not only when you are happy. Amen? In fact, I think singing is much better when you are not very happy. It's much more meaningful. It's much more powerful. Because the Bible tells us, a story that you know very well in the book of Acts, Paul and Silas, they did what? They sang where? In the prison. That's not the most comfortable place for you to sing. But they sang. The psalmist said, I will sing. What are you singing about? The mercies of the Lord. The mercies of the Lord. The mercies that are shown to you on a daily basis. The message that you receive from God on a daily basis. Sing about that mercy of the Lord. Let people hear. Let them know about the goodness of the Lord. Let them know that God is merciful. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. You know, many people will look at situations in life and they said, why should I sing in this situation? Well, we can ask Joseph. Joseph, why must you sing? Why must you be happy? Why must you continue to hope and to believe that the Lord is going to deliver you? It's because either, either things are good or things are, are bad, God is always good. Amen? And that's the reason why you have to sing. Your condition does not change God. Your condition does not make God think, well, because he is sad, then there's nothing to sing about. Because he is joyful now, then we can sing. That's not God. God is forever settled. Nothing will change him. And so, either we are happy or we are sad, we have to sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth. With my mouth. That's very, very important. With my mouth. That's personal. You are not going to say, well, because others are singing, then I'm singing. Because others are rejoicing, then I'm rejoicing. No, it's something that God has done for you. It's something that he has done in your life. And for that reason, you are joyful. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. In this world, there will be tribulation. But he says, be of good what? Of good share. Be happy. Be joyful. Praise the name of the Lord. Because he has better plan for you. If he allows anything in your life, he has a plan for that. I said he has a plan for that. Whatever he's allowing in your life right now, God has a plan for it. If you believe it, 
it shall work for your good. I said it shall work for your good. Because all things work together for good. For those who love the Lord and for those who are called according to his purpose. So the psalmist said, with my mouth, I will make known the faithfulness of God. To how many people? All generations. No limits. Wherever you are found, wherever you go, you make known, you declare the faithfulness, the goodness of the Lord. You know, somebody said, the greatest miracle in the world is the one that you get. Amen? The greatest miracle in the world is the one that you get. Many other people will be getting miracles. That's great. Blind eyes being opened. That's wonderful. But the greatest one is the one that God gives you. Because that touches you. That made a, 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 a difference in your life. In verse 2, it says, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my sure saying. I have sworn unto David, my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever. And built up thy throne to all generations. Look, look, look at all those promises. All those blessings that come through commitment and determination to serve the Lord. As you sing of his mercies, as you make known his faithfulness, the Lord is saying, he says he has a covenant with you, and his covenant he will not break, because God is faithful. God is trustworthy. You can hold on to his word, and his word is true. And his word will be true in your life in Jesus' name. He says, thy seed will I establish forever. If God establish your seed, that means God will establish you. Amen? I said, if God establish your seed, he will establish you. So you can be assured in your heart that whatever fears are all around, anything that wants to make you to be afraid, remember that the Lord said, I will establish your seed. That means, by the grace of God, the Lord will establish you. I said the Lord will establish you. He says, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Faithfulness in the congregation of of the saints. God has been faithful to us, but now we need to be faithful to that God. The one who has blessed us so much, it is time for us to begin to bring blessing even into the house of the Lord, into the presence of the Lord, into the grace that God has given us. We begin to bring the blessing, the goodness of the Lord, the grace of the Lord upon the work of the Lord and the Lord Almighty. We make that blessing to continue to increase in your life and in my life in Jesus' name. Singing of the mercy of the Lord is one of the most beautiful things for you and I to do. Singing of the mercy of the Lord. Because when we sing with all our hearts, others will hear. People will know about the faithfulness of the Lord. And through us, they will come and know our God. I pray that by the grace of God, as you and I begin to sing, the Lord Almighty will begin to take away every situation that is contrary to our life in Jesus' name. The determination in our heart to continue to sing brings more blessing, brings more favor, brings more goodness of the Lord into our life and into our heart. And as we continue to sing, more of his blessings we will enjoy. And I believe by the grace of God, we will enjoy the blessing of the Lord in Jesus' name. Three areas I'd like to speak to us this morning. The first part is applying that I solution. What do I mean by the I solution? The I solution, that is, the solution that you made. I'm going to read to you some areas of description. The I. You and I know what the I stands for. Number one, there is the I of isolation. 
the eye of isolation, where a man isolates himself. And in such situation, not much blessing will come. It is as we partner with the Lord, as we work with the Lord, as we become his workman, as we become his sharp, threshing instrument, that he is going to do great things in our life. And those impossibilities, the eye of impossibility, will be removed. And everything will become possible. I said, things in your life will become possible. So shall it be in Jesus' name. So number one is the eye of isolation. Number two is the eye of integration. Joining together. Uniting together. This morning you, lo- you learn about unity in the church. Unity of the people of God. So, as you look at that word unity, it talks about integration, partnership, progress, perseverance, together, in the will of God, in the work of God. And by the grace of God, as we do that, blessings of God, we continue to uh, uh, dwell in our lives in Jesus' name. Number three, the eye of indwelling. The eye of indwelling. Because Number one, when you take yourself out of isolation and then you bring yourself into integration, meaning you partner with the Lord, you partner with the people of God, you partner with your brothers and sisters, your leaders in the church, and we work together, we are going to find out that we are going to all together dwell in the blessing of the Lord. Amen? We will dwell in the blessing of the Lord. So let's look at the first one, the eye of isolation. Eye of isolation. You remember the case of um, the young man in the scripture who abandoned his family and then he came back. What did he say when he was coming back? He says, I will arise. I will do what? I will arise. First Corinthians, let's read First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 11. The eye of isolation. When that, when that is available, when that is working, either in the church or in an individual life or in a family, not much will be done. The eye of isolation. In Corinthians 11, in verse 11, if you notice there, that's a one, 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 one. Representing the eye. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. You see that? The man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that is telling you something. He's saying very clearly now, one is not without the other. You can't be in isolation. There are many things that you can do by yourself, but there are so many other things you can never achieve by yourself. And when it comes to fruitfulness in spiritual things, isolation, it leads to defeat. And so, the Lord is saying, there are things you have to do away with. The eye of isolation. The negative lifestyle. The no's, the nevers, the not, and neither. That people always have. You have to die to self. That's what it means. You totally die to yourself. And then you are yielded unto God. That's where the kind of fruitfulness that you and I are looking for can be able to be seen. In Matthew chapter 20, the eye of isolation, it leads to idleness. Idleness. Matthew chapter 20, in verse number 6. Matthew 20, verse 6. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, why stand ye here all the day idle? When you are isolated, 
You become an idle person. And an idle man can never become fruitful. So look at what happened here. They say unto him, because no man has hired us. He said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Let's put it this way. No believer should be idle in the house of the Lord. We all need to be doing something for the Lord. These individuals were idle. And then they were, they were asked, why are ye idle here? He says, no man has hired us. Well, let me tell you, the Lord has hired you. I said the Lord has hired you. And what does he want you to do? Bring souls to his kingdom. That's the best work that anyone can do for the Lord. So he says, go ye also into the vineyard. The Lord is asking you, go into my vineyard. Go into the world. Go out there, partner with me, and bring souls into the kingdom. It is very, very essential. And whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Whatsoever is right, he is the one that, that gives the reward. He is the one that is going to reward you. Don't worry about the worldly reward. Be concerned, be bothered about the heavenly reward. The Lord is saying, whatsoever it is that you are worth, I will give it to you. You will not lose your inheritance. I say you will not lose your inheritance. So number one, the eye of isolation, it leads to idleness. It leads people to become an idle hand. You will not be an idle hand. The Lord will use you mightily in, the, in Jesus' name. It leads to imagination. When you are idle, you begin to imagine a whole lot of things that are not there. Look at uh, Psalm 2, Psalm number 2, verse 1. Why do the hidden rage and the people do what? Imagine a vain things. The eye of isolation. It leads to idleness. It leads to imagination that is evil. Imagining vain things. Vain things. Number three, it leads to imputing. What does that mean? Judgmental spirit. Judgmental spirit. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 19. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of what? Reconciliation. Not imputing idleness, imagination, imputing, judging. Then you begin to judge everyone else. You begin to impute iniquity where there is none. It leads to imputing. You begin to judge. That's because the eye of isolation always leads to negativity. But if a man is going to be able to turn away from there, he has to die to self. So number one, it leads to imputing. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Number one, it leads to idleness. Isolation, and then leads to imagination. It leads to imputing. It leads to infirmity. Your heart becomes very sick. You are no longer as strong in the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. Look at what he says. Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse nine. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. That's the word of the Lord there. My grace is sufficient for thee. God's grace is sufficient for you. I said God's grace is sufficient for you. And so whatever the situation is, don't let that weigh you down. That's what Paul is saying here. He says God told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in what? In my infirmities. Glory in infirmity, meaning you are okay. 
You are not allowing the infirmity to weigh you down. But in negativity, you are dwelling in the, on that infirmity. Paul said, I'm not going to allow infirmity to weigh me down. No infirmity is going to pull me down. No infirmity is going, is going to make me weak. I'm going to glory in that infirmity because I know that my God is able to see me through. Amen? He says, God says to him, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect. God will perfect your strength. Whatever weakness is there, God will perfect your strength in Jesus' name. And your strength will overcome every weakness in Jesus' name. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see that? If that eye of infirmity is not taken away, then the power of God is not able to rest. But when you tell yourself, I can do all things, that's the eye that we are talking about. That's the kind of eye that you need. I can do all things. Not the eye of isolation, but the eye of integration. I can do all things. When I partner with Christ, when I work for Christ, when I do the will of Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So shall it be for us in Jesus' name. So we see there that the eye, it leads to a whole lot of things. It causes idleness. It causes even indignation. It brings iniquity. In fact, it causes ignorance. It, be, it becomes a factor of ignorance. Imagination of evil things. And before you know it, it's like nothing else can be done. Look. 137. It's like a negation of this word of God in Luke. Luke 1. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. It says, For with God, nothing shall be what? Impossible. But the man who has that eye of isolation, everything else becomes impossible. It cannot become fruitful. It cannot move forward. Because if a grain of corn falls to the ground, it does what? It dies by itself. It will just die by itself. So you see here that there has to be integration. There has to be coming together. Harnessing our resources together. All that the Lord has deposited in your heart. In my heart. We have to start making use of it. Why is that very important? Because, as people say around here, if you don't use it, you do what? You lose it. The resources that God has given unto you, many of us are very good at helping people. If you stop helping people, you will lose that gift. The resources of being able to talk to people and bring them to the Lord. And many of us are very good at that. If you stop using it, you lose it. So God is saying, partner with me so that we can do great things. And the Lord will do great things to you. I said the Lord will do great things to you. So number one, the eye of isolation. Number two is the eye of integration. Integration. Coming together. Working together, doing the will of God. First Corinthians again, First Corinthians eleven, First Corinthians eleven verse eleven. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse eleven. It says, "Nevertheless, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man." Even in our own physical life, when a family is separated in goals and aspirations, they don't get much done. They don't achieve a lot. There's not much success that they record. When the man is struggling on his own and the woman is struggling on her own and everyone is just holding on just for the, for the sake of self, but here is what I find out, that when the two of them partner together, when they work together, they achieve great things. They do great things. They get the impossible done. So that's what the Lord is telling us here. He says, nevertheless, no matter the situation, 
whatever it is, whatever the argument may be, the man is not without the woman, and the woman is not without the man. Bring it biologically. How can we get fruitfulness in the family without a man and a woman cooperating together? It's not possible. It's not possible. So the Lord is using the things that we know to tell us the things that we need to know. That when there is partnership, when we work together, God does great things through us. And God will do great things in our life in Jesus' name. So the Lord is saying, as he has sown into us, we also need to keep on sowing. We need to keep on doing more so that more of the blessings of the Lord will come into our life in Jesus' name. The eye of integration. What does he do? It brings great blessing. It brings increase. Great increase. But how can he bring increase? What must we do for that integration to occur? Number one, we have to incline. I'm still using the letter I now. Incline. What does that mean? It means you listen. You listen to God. What God has to say. You don't shut God off and say, I have the solution. The solution to every situation is in the hand of God. I said God has a solution to every situation. And if you and I are going to get a solution to any situation in our life, we have to incline our ears unto the Lord. Look at what the Bible says in uh, Joshua chapter 24. As he was counseling the people of God. He said, you look at all that God has done for you in these many years. But let me tell you, don't rest on your oars. Don't rest on your success. Don't rest on what God has done in the past. From this point on, it is very important for you to continue to incline your ears. Jo Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24 in verse 23. Now therefore, put away said he, the strange gods which are among you and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Put it away. Everything that has become a God, everything that we are holding on to, the Lord is saying, put them away. Now incline your ears unto me. That is telling me that there are new things that God wants to do, but you have to listen. I have to listen. God is saying, you don't have to be so limited. You can increase, but you have to listen. I pray we will listen. The Lord will help us to listen. Incline your ear. Incline it to the Lord. That's number one. Number two, inquire. What does that mean? You ask. You ask. I think we assume a lot. Many a times we assume that we know a lot. In fact, there are many things we think we know before that we think was right, that actually if you sit down and you examine and look into it, you'll find out that they are wrong. But you and I can pursue that point of I am right, I am right, to the end. And you'll be thinking you are right. But if you can just inquire of the Lord, ask from the Lord, the Lord will show you new things. I said the Lord will show you new things. Because when you inquire, whoever inquires of the Lord gets an answer. If you ask him in all sincerity, the Lord will answer you in Jesus' name. First Samuel, it's a story that we know very well. It's about David in, in chapter 30. Several times, the man inquired from the Lord. He asked the Lord what to do. 1 Samuel 30, look at verse 6. And David was greatly distressed. The situation was just terrible. He was distressed, almost despairing of life. For the people spake of stoning him. Now, when you are a leader, and people say they are going to stone you, that's not a good place to be. And you know what? They, can, they actually can do it. If they desire, decide to do it, they will do it and you'll be dead. Because you are just one person in the midst of a multitude. So the whole 
congregation of people before they, they were distressed because of the evil that has happened in the camp. There was discouragement. There was depression. If I were told that they wept, in verse 4, they wept until they had no power to weep. The discouragement was bad. But in the midst of that, there is something that gets a man out. Inquiring. Inquiring. Asking the Lord. We need, we need to inquire. The eye of integration. When you inquire from the Lord, you are partnering with him. You are asking him, you are the only one who knows the way. Guide me. And he will guide you. I said he will guide you. In the case of David, he did. He, he guided him. He was distressed. So in verse 7, David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the he for. And Abiathar brought hither the he for to David. And David inquired at the Lord. Amen? He asked the Lord, what shall we do? What should we do at this point? Because we don't even know what to do. The enemy seemed to have sprung a surprise on us and has succeeded. Now, how do we reverse what the enemy has done? Only the Lord can tell you how to do that. When your enemy has cornered you and they got you in a place where you can't escape, how do you get out? And I think David has learned from experience that when you depend on the Lord, it doesn't matter what the enemy is doing, you are going to be victorious. I said you are going to be victorious. Because once or twice, Saul cornered him in a wilderness. And I remember one particular situation. God had to cause some trouble in the land to distract Saul, the king. And just at the point that he was supposed to get David and kill him and destroy the vision, God caused another trouble. He sent a messenger to him that the Philistines have invaded the land. And the man ran back. He left him. Only God can do that. He's the only one who has the power to do that. He can see everything. He can tie them all together. He can orchestrate things that you and I can never understand. So David inquired at the Lord. He says, should I pursue this, this troop? Should I? And the Lord said, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And he pursued. And in verse 18, we are told that David did what? He recovered all. All your blessings you will recover. And those blessings will multiply in your life in Jesus' name. But you have to partner with the Lord. Partner with the Lord. Work with the Lord. Number one, Incline thy ears to the Lord. Number two, inquire, ask him. Number three, get instruction. Allow the Lord to instruct you. As he did now, he, he instructed David. He gave him instruction. You can see it in that passage. God instructed him. He said, pursue and you shall overtake. If the Lord has said, don't pursue them. If he had pursued them, he would have lost. I pray the Lord will give us instruction. I said, I pray the Lord will give us instruction. And as the Lord give you that instruction, then now turn back the negative imagination. Remember the Bible says the people in Psalm 2 verse 1, it says, why did people imagine vain things? Now turn your imagination to imagining good things now. You incline your ear, you take instruction from the Lord, and you begin to imagine good things. You begin to imagine the victory. Imagine what God is going to do. That means you are having faith. That's another word for that. Begin to build up faith in yourself and trust in that the Lord is going to do it. And the Lord will do it in Jesus' name. And then you are going to find out that there will be increase. When you begin to imagine it, and you are working with the Lord, you are partnering with the Lord, the Lord will increase you. I said the Lord will increase you. And the Lord will bring his blessing upon your life in Jesus' name. You begin to say, I can do all things. The eye of integration. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I therefore so run. That's just you. But you are running with the Lord. 
I run to obtain. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. He says, I am running. But now I know I'm going to obtain. That's the positive imagination. That's the good imagination. You are beginning to imagine. This summer, you are imagining how many souls you can win to the Lord. You are imagining how many people you can reach. Begin to imagine good things. Begin to walk with the Lord. You are beginning to think, my family can do this. Our house fellowship can do this. Our church can do this. And as you begin to imagine all those good things, you are going to find out that God will begin to increase you with wisdom and understanding. Amen? He begin to give you the wisdom. He begin to open your heart to things that you can do to increase in the things of the Lord. It starts with inclining your ear and inquiring of the Lord and listening to his instruction. And then you begin to imagine. And as you imagine and you walk at it, you even intercede. You intercede for it. You pray. For this shall the house of Israel be inquired of me. You intercede. You talk to the Lord about those goals. And as you are talking to the Lord, you are trusting the Lord. You are walking in the integrity of your heart. You are not looking for any other way that is different from the right way. You are walking in the integrity of your heart. You are interceding. And then you are incre increasing in the blessings of the Lord. Psalm 67. Psalm 67 in verse number 4. Psalm 67 in verse number 4. There it says, Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. It is when you and I begin to partner with the Lord and we praise him and we intercede and we begin to talk to him about the harvest that you are going to find out that God will start doing it. But we can't just be like the idle one. God will do it. I'm idle here. Nobody has hired me. God has hired you. I said God has hired you. It is time for fruitfulness. It is time for increase. It is time that we begin to do something for the glory of the Lord. And as you do so, the Lord will increase you there in Jesus' name. I said the Lord will increase you there in Jesus' name. The Lord will increase you there in Jesus' name. Somebody said you either sit down for an ending or you stand up for a new beginning. That's what I'm challenging you for today. You either sit down for an ending. That's the eye of isolation. He says the end has come. Nothing can be done. It's over. But... There's somebody who is standing and he says, I think something new is beginning. Are you one of those people? I said, are you one of those people? Standing for a new beginning. And when you and I stand together and we stand with the Lord, something new will begin our life in Jesus' name. Don't just sit down for an ending because it is not over until it is over. God still have a great thing to do in your life. There are still wonderful things that God wants to do through you. And my prayer is that you will allow him to do it in Jesus' name. I say you will allow him to do it in Jesus' name. Because now when you get to this point, then you are bold. You say, I therefore run like Apostle Paul. I am running. And I'm going to obtain. Look at, look at, look at it in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 26. First Corinthians, you are bold. You say, I want to start running. Because as I run, I know that the Lord is going to do great things. The Lord is going to make me to achieve. There is no one who went on the track and field and is saying, I'm not going to win. Everyone who is there wants to win. And you know one thing I, I, I think is joyful in the Christian race is that we can all win. I said we can all win. You and I don't have to struggle together like those who are on the race out there. 
We can all win, and we are all winners in Christ. I said we are all winners in Christ. Because when we walk with the Lord, we all become winners. And God will make you a winner in Jesus' name. So in 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul is saying in chapter 9, he's saying there in verse, uh, verse 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may do what? That ye may obtain. Start running like you have never run before. Run with all your power. So run. Run with every enthusiasm and zeal that you have for the Lord. So run. And then in verse 25, he says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That means you are persevering. You are not giving up. You temper yourself. Just because others seem to be running ahead of you does not mean that you have lost the race. Just because you to one sinner and he's not giving you a hand of fellowship, that doesn't mean that that's the end of the evangelism. Just because you invited one person and that person is not you know, following you, that doesn't mean the end of the whole exercise. So Apostle Paul is saying, every man that strives for mastery is temporary. He says, if you're going to master how to do this thing, you start doing it. Because by doing it, you become a master of it. It's the same way as saying, if you don't do it, you lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. So he's saying, if you're going to be a master of this thing, you have to start doing. He says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we, an incorruptible, praise the Lord, an incorruptible. That means the reward that God will give you and I. When we get over there, it's an incorruptible crown. And the Lord will give it to us in Jesus' name. Look at verse 27, very, very important. But I, it's always that I. It's, it's a personal decision. It's a personal decision. Thank God that all of us can decide together and say, we are going out to so-and-so place to evangelize. We are going out to so-and-so place to do this and to do that. But you as an individual, like Paul, Paul said, but I keep under my body. That means you discipline yourself to do this. Because let me tell you, life will not allow you to want to do it. Circumstances around you will not want to permit you. There will be a lot of distraction around you that will want to take you away from doing that which God wants you to do. But Paul said, I, it's, it's something that I do. I do it myself. I keep under my body. And bring it into subjection. When you feel like just whiling away the time, you keep under your body. When you feel like not doing anything, you say, well, I have to do something. You put yourself in subjection. Lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Getting to heaven is an individual decision. It's not something you do for other people. Paul said, going there is a decision I have made. And I'm watching over it. I'm guarding it jealously so that I don't lose that which God has given me. I keep under my body. I bring it under subjection. I pray the Lord will give you that determination. I pray the Lord will give you that kind of sense of duty to want to do the will of God in Jesus' name. So Apostle Paul is telling, he's giving us words of integration here. Things that we have to do. Working with the Lord. To be able to bring the fruitfulness that we are talking about. And the Lord will make us fruitful in Jesus' name. In verse 16, in verse 16, it tells us something there very important that we need to. In verse 16 of chapter 9, it says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. That's the individual. So there's no, I have no pride here. I put the pride on them because I want the Lord to be glorified. I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me. It's something that God has commanded. It's something that he has asked me to do. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea. In fact, the apostle even put himself under a curse. He said, if I don't do this, woe is unto me. 
if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, if I do it willingly without being forced, I have a reward. You have a reward. I said you have a reward. And God will grant you that reward in Jesus' name. If I do this thing willingly, there is a reward for you and I. But if against my will, against my will, against my will, why should it be against our will? We must do it willingly. We must do it with our heart. We must do it as a duty that God has committed into our hand. And the Lord will grant us the grace in Jesus' name. And if you and I are going to do it, we have to pray that the Lord will give us the zeal to be able to do it. Because in these last days, the zeal to go out is dying. The zeal to talk to others is dying. Somebody said the doom of a nation can only be averted by the storm of a glowing passion. The doom of a nation, the doom of an individual, the doom of a family can only be averted by a glowing zeal, a passionate desire to do that which the Lord has asked us to do. So we have to have that passionate desire. It is not enough to just be a Christian. God is looking for committed Christians, those who are serious for his work. I pray the Lord will count you worthy. The Lord will count me worthy. The Lord will count us worthy so that we'll be able to do the will of God in Jesus' name. Brethren, in these last days, it is not enough to read about a revival. We need to witness a revival. And that revival is possible. That revival lies with you. You can make it happen. You can allow it to happen. A revival can happen in your own life. It can happen in my life. It can happen in our church. And if we allow God, the Lord will do it in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. So number one, eye of isolation. Number two, the eye of integration. And number three, the eye of indwelling. Amen? You will dwell in the house of the Lord. Because when we partner with the Lord, he makes us to dwell in his house. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. The eye of indwelling. You shun every isolation. You embrace integration. And that puts you in the indwelling of the secret place of the Most High. So it says in Psalm 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's the assurance that God gives you and me. That when we push away every isolation and we partner with him and put everything that we have on the line and we are ready to walk with the Lord and we are ready for fruitfulness, gracious fruitfulness, it is possible. I said it is possible. I said it is possible. You know, if you say so, it will be so unto you. If you agree, it will be possible for you. No, if I say God will give you money now, I think you will say a better amen. I think I will hear a better amen. If I say God is going to give you a better job, I think I will hear a better amen. But I'm saying that God will make you fruitful. I said he will make you fruitful in good work. Because listen, my brothers and sisters, everything you get on this side of eternity, brick, mortar, bond, everything you get on this side, there's only one thing you get that goes with you to heaven. Only the work that you do for God. That's the only thing that lasts. So if I tell you, God will give you more children, and you say, Amen. More cars. Amen. How many can you ride anyway? Several houses. Amen. The amen is, you know, is blowing the roof. But now I'm saying, God will make you an evangelist. Amen. God will empower you amen. to go out and work for him. Amen. God will touch your heart. Amen. And the zeal for the Lord will be imputed in your heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Coldness will disappear. Fire of the Lord will come. So shall it be for you in Jesus' name. We are going to rise up and spend a few minutes in prayer.
Rise up now and let us pray. It's not something we just talk about. We have to pray about it. It's something you pray about it. You say, Lord, here am I. Bring yourself on the altar. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, this thing we are talking about doesn't just happen. The only way it can happen is by presenting your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why don't you present yourself to the Lord now and say, Lord, here am I. I'm available for you. Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord and he said, here am I. Send me. Are you available? Can the Lord use you? Open your mouth and pray and say, Lord, I'm available. I'm available. You remember I told you today's prayer is going to be a prayer by you. I can't make this consecration for you. I can't consecrate you to the Lord. I can pray about it, but there has to be a desire in you that you will do it. So my prayer for you is that God will make you available. God will make you available. God will give you the imagination. Imagination to do good. Imagination to work for the Lord. Imagination that on a daily basis, as you imagine that I'm going to work, you also imagine I need to work for God. As you are thinking about, I need to become fruitful in my earthly endeavor, you are also thinking, I need to be fruitful for the Lord. The two of them must go together. You say, Lord, I don't want to appear before you empty-handed. Empty-handed. I don't want to be empty-handed before you. I don't want to come before you empty-handed. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Make me fruitful. Make me fruitful. Let there be fruitfulness in my life. Let there be fruitfulness in my life. It is possible, my brother. It is possible, my sister. The Lord is able to do it. Ask that the Lord will help you. He will give you the grace. He will give you the grace. Yes, it doesn't have to end like this. Something new is possible. Something great is possible. But you have to ask God for it. You have to inquire of the Lord. You have to incline your ear. A Samuel never opened his ear to hear Samuel, Samuel, that will have never been an anointing and a consecration and a commission for him. It was when he inquired of the Lord and he inclined his ear unto the Lord. The Lord gave him a mission. The Lord commissioned him as the new prophet for the nation of Israel. And the Lord helped him greatly. The Lord will help you. Make your commitment today and say, Lord, as I go out of here today, I will do something for the Lord. I will not be idle. I will not be idle. I will do something for the Lord. And the Lord will help you. The Lord will help you. Ask that God will take away every idleness, every ignorance, every evil imagination, every thought of impossibility. God will take it out. All the judging spirit, the people they send you to go and talk to, you are judging them before you get there. You say, Lord, give me compassion. Let there be compassion in my heart. Let there be love that when I see people out there, I know that these are never dying souls. These are souls that will never die. It's either they go to heaven or they go to hell. And you are saying, and Bible says, because we know the terror of God, we persuade men. Because we know the terror of God. Because God is terrible. Yes, God of love. Yes, God that gives all blessing. <laughs> but Bible says, but our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. He says, every wicked soul, they shall go to hell. And every nation that forget God, they will go to hell. Oh, do you want this whole nation to go to hell? Do you want your brother, your sister... Those who have not known the Lord, your, your blood brother, your blood sister, your relations who have not known the Lord, you don't want them to go to hell. Plead on their behalf. Intercede for them. Pray that the Lord will visit them. Somebody prayed concerning you. Somebody interceded concerning you, and you gave your life to Christ. Can you do the same for others? That the Lord will visit them. That the Lord will grant them salvation. This salvation is very important. It's precious. It cost Jesus Christ his blood. It cost him his blood. 33, and he had, uh, 33 years, you know, of his life. Cut short like that. And he just ended the journey so that you and I, he died in his prime, in his youth, so that you and I can have eternal life. And he says, he has made us now to reconcile men unto him. Let's pray that the Lord will give us the grace. That we will, we will do this work. We will not slack concerning this work in the name of Jesus. Pray for the fire of the Lord upon your altar. That the fire of God will fall upon your altar. The altar of your heart. 
the altar of your soul. God will take away coldness, lack of compassion out of our life in the name of Jesus. We become compassionate people. We are concerned about soul. Oh, how we were, how we were fervent in those early days of being believers that we do everything possible. It's like God is going to come tomorrow, but because God is delaying his coming, God is delaying his coming. Is that why we are slowing down? Maybe it's because of us that God has not come. Because he said, I see I have many people in this city. I have many people I need to reach. I have many souls that doesn't need to die. There are still many ignorant people out there. Can you do something about that? Can you do something about that? He said, if you give a cup of cold water to any of this one, you will not lose your reward. Oh, pray that the Lord will help you. And the Lord will help me. The Lord will help us all to do something in the name of Jesus. Yes, we have our dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Yes, that's a place that he wants us to dwell. But what will happen to our relations, our friends, our neighbors who have not known the Lord? What are we going to say about them? They need to come to the Lord. Do something about it. Do something about it. You see that man on the street? He's drunk and you are sneering at him. You say, oh, what a foolish drunk man. Oh, don't worry about his foolishness. Do something about it and pray that the Lord will, will, will deliver him from that spirit that has held him down. That spirit that wants to kill him. Pray that the Lord will deliver him. Ask that the Lord will do it, and he will do it. He will do it. He will do it. And tell yourself, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can be fruitful. I can win souls for the Lord. Yes, I may not have been able to do that in a long while, but I can do this. God can empower me as I walk with God and he walks with me. Yes, this is possible. This is possible because with God, nothing shall be impossible. With our God, nothing shall be impossible. The Lord is able to make you to abound unto all good works. The Lord is able to make you abound unto fruitfulness. Pray that God will make us fruitful. In the name of Jesus, you look around, you say, Lord, you say, Lord, we need people in all of these seats. We need people to come here and hear the word of God. How would they come if there is no preacher? How would they come if nobody preached to them? God has commissioned you. God has given you, he has hired you. He said, go out. Go out and do the work. Go to the highways. Go to everywhere. Go, go anywhere you can go. Everywhere you can go. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring the souls in. As you do that, the Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. As you do that for his glory. As you do it for his holy name, the Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. Pray that, oh, oh Lord, this week, this week, make a commitment to the Lord. Because if you don't have a commitment, you don't have anything to follow. Have a goal. And you can say, Lord, even in this new month, I can still win one person. I can win one person to the Lord. It is possible, my brother. It is possible, my sister. If somebody doesn't have a job, what do they do? They pursue after the employers. They run after them until they get a job. If you want to be fruitful, you can be fruitful. Pursue after the souls outside there. Ask that the Lord will give you favor. Pray for the favor of the Lord. The Lord, you will lead me. Souls that are ready. Souls that the devil want to lay hand on and they belong to you. Lead me to them so that before Satan gets there, I will get there. Before Satan gets there, I will get there. The Lord will help you. The Lord will help you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we round up, you probably have heard about a man called Arthur Blessed. How many have heard about him? Arthur Blessed. Do we know who he is? Okay. Arthur Blessed is the man that carries the, uh, the cross all over the world. Have you heard about that? Okay. Something happened that tells me that one man can make a difference. Now, you may not, you may not buy the idea of auto blessing just carrying cross all over the world, right? To you, that may be an extremist thing, but he said that's what God told him to do. And you don't, contr you, you don't argue with a man when he says God asked him to do it. I'll tell you just one story before we pray. Otto Blessed was carrying the cross on a beach. He was the only one there. He said there was no one there, but he just felt like the Lord was calling him to go to that beach. There was nobody on that beach. So he kept on pacing up and down. He carried, the cross is always on him, and he's always going and praying and praying. And then he said, suddenly, from nowhere, a young lady ran towards him. And ran past him. 
He said initially he was thinking, maybe he wants to talk to him, but the, the lady didn't wait. She just ran across. As she ran across, she was running towards the sea. So he was concerned. That, what is wrong with this young lady? Then she, he said, well, I thought maybe he is going to swim. So he began to pray. He began to pray for that young girl. As the young girl reached the depth of the water, she ran back. Ran back and then ran towards this man and knelt down and began to weep. So, Arthur Blessing was, was confused. He said, do you understand what I'm doing? This is the cross, the cross of Jesus. You know, he was trying to explain what it means. You know, where Jesus died and all of that, he was trying to explain to the young girl. The young girl said, no, that's not the reason why I came back. Actually, as I was running to the sea, I wanted to commit suicide. I wanted to die. This was supposed to be the last day. He said, but as I was running, I didn't even see you. I didn't know that I passed you. But as I was running towards the water, I told God, I said, God, if you are, if you are, if you are alive, show yourself to me. He said, and then God made him to look back. And he saw the man carrying the cross. So the Lord said, you see, I am alive. I still say, if you want to desire salvation, run back to that man. You will be saved. The girl ran back to that man, gave her life to the Lord. Now, brethren, let me tell you, that man's method may look very, very out of it to you, but his soul saved through him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I've told us one other uh, story before. A couple, they were in a bitter divorce. But the children were so bothered. So, for some reason, just to cut the long story short, they decided, okay, we are going to do one thing for our child before we finally separate. We'll take the child to the beach and let him enjoy that day. So, they took the child around and all of that, took him to eat and that. And then finally, they settled down at the beach. And the man took the son, and they were, you know, swimming and all of that. And then the woman was just on one side laying down, thinking of what next to do after they leave. And then someone went by her and dropped a New Testament, the little New Testament. The woman didn't have anything to do because she was too distraught. Some, somewhere, the Lord opened her eyes to look on the side, and she saw that there was something, so... She picked it and opened to John and read it all through. She kept reading. And the Lord was giving her assurance everything would be okay. Well, to cut the long story short, after the man came, he made the man to read the, the New Testament. Both of them gave their life to Christ and the marriage stayed. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. There is something you can do. There is something I can do. It's not just about increasing church as part of it. That's a good thing. That's not wrong. But it's populating the kingdom. That people will not die. That homes will be saved. In these last days, nothing will save people than Christ. When crisis come and Christ is not there, that's the end. But you and I can be the difference. Tell somebody you can be the difference. You can make a difference. So we are going to tell the Lord, oh Lord, as I'm going out of here now, lead me to make a difference in somebody's life. Pray that prayer in all sincerity and the Lord will lead you and the Lord will guide you and the Lord will direct you. I believe that the Lord will do it. If you pray it in all sincerity, the Lord will guide you. He will direct you. It will give you that direction. There are, there are people who are in crisis. And they need Christ. And you may be thinking, they will not listen. Who told you? They will listen. Pray that God will take you out of your couch of laziness. Out of my couch of idleness. And we will do something for the Lord. When we do it, heaven will rejoice. Heaven will rejoice. Both on your behalf and on behalf of that soul. That you bring to the kingdom. Our Father and our Lord, 
We need to apologize. We need to plead for our laziness, our lack of compassion, a lack of concern for dying souls. Many of us, including the speaker, we have not done enough to impress God, to even want to give us more. So, Lord, we are praying that you will help us. You will assist us. Our consecration today will not be in vain. It will be something that we do, that heaven will have a record of it in Jesus' name. Lord, we talk about no signs, no wonders. But the Bible tells us that you don't give your, 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 your costly things, your costly pearls, you don't give them to dogs. You don't cast your pearls before dogs or swines. You give them to those who value it. And the power that you give to work miracles, Lord, is for the church, for the growth of the church, for your people to be able to walk and bring souls and become fruitful. So, Lord, if we are not willing to go out, obviously you will not be willing to endow us with your power. But from today, we repent. From today, we ask that, Lord, all that you have denied us as a result of our vacillation, we are drawing back. We are not doing enough. Oh, Lord, I pray that from today, you will forgive us in Jesus' name. You will restore your power to us again. You will restore your zeal in our heart. That the desire to go out and talk to people about Christ. Not talking to people because we want to bring them to church only. But because we know they are undying soul. And if they die, they will go to hell. Oh, Lord, I pray. Let our eyes be open. To see men and women like that in Jesus' name. Bible says, let this mind be in you. Oh, I remember Christ was hungry. And the disciple went to look for food. And the woman by the well came. And he forgot about the eating and the drinking. He began to minister to the woman. Until that woman became converted. And through her, the whole city were brought to the Lord. Oh God, how I pray. The doors that you are opening unto us. I pray we will not close them by ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. But that Lord, we will walk with you. Because when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he shares on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with them who we trust and obey. Oh Lord, I pray the grace to trust you and to be obedient. Not just trusting you, but obeying you. Turn to us in Jesus' name. Lord, anoint my brothers and sisters that as they go right now, let them go in the power of the Lord. Let them go in the spirit of the Lord. The kind of anointing you gave to the 70 and you sent them out and they came back and Jesus himself said, I beheld Satan fall down from heaven. Oh Lord, I pray with that kind of anointing, give to them in Jesus' name. That as they go out to propagate the gospel, Lord, great things will be done through them and in them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. We worship and we glorify you. Be with us as we go. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.